Israel was completely behind the October 7th attacks, organized, funded, and enabled by Israel. Watching just a few of these images tells you that the nation of Israel has become a fascist, genocidal monstrosity. But the paid defenders of Israeli genocide say that it's necessary to kill all those kids because of the terrible crimes committed by Hamas on October 7th. Killing Hamas makes Israel safe. Yeah, Hamas is responsible for killing all those but children. The Hamas kills cannot... children. Hamas is an evil but organization. I hope children. Israel destroys Hamas. That's what I hope. And I want to help Israel destroy Hamas. But these two Israeli army veterans want us to know that the whole story of October 7th is a lie. And they are furious about it. Israel is probably the most advanced surveillance state in the world. And the Gaza border is probably the most heavily surveilled. I know all these things firsthand because I served on the Gaza border. Do you know how long it takes an attack helicopter to get activated and blow up any one of those tractors or pickup trucks? Less than five minutes. It could have been a matter of five minutes before the whole thing was upended. I'm sorry, that's an inside job. I am uh, an Israeli. I live in Jerusalem. I was serving in the army. I was in intelligence unit. Uh, defense is guarded 24-7, not only by patrolling cars, not only by cameras, not only by a fence that is an electric fence, also by a laser um, that is activating in alarms. Nobody can cross that fence. You cannot enter unless you have help from inside. There was help from inside. This operation was not made by Hamas. The plan is to flatten Gaza. Let's talk the truth. These two Israeli army veterans are mad, and they say Israel's defenses should have stopped the invaders. Let's look at these supposedly impenetrable border defenses that they are talking about, shall we? The wall is steel-reinforced concrete, 20 feet high and 22 miles long. In front of it is a minor fence, and behind it is a $2 billion electrified steel fence. Every few hundred yards there are machine gun turrets, patrolled 24-7 by soldiers, all of it backed up with an array of devices for detecting anyone approaching the fence. These devices include radar systems with cameras that cover the entire territory of the Gaza Strip, night vision cameras, of course, a system of lasers for detecting movement, super high-def cameras that can see faces close up from six miles away. The cameras are located atop surveillance towers. Many of these cameras are mounted in balloons, allowing the spotters to see deep into Hamas's backyard. A small army of spotters monitor these cameras intensely, 24-7, and the spotters reported that they could see training camps, which are as far from the border as you can get. Before you're out of range of these cameras, you're in the sea. The cameras send a picture of any intruder to the spotters, who then send the information to the soldiers who operate the machine gun towers by remote control with devastating effect. These machine gun turrets should have exterminated the Hamas invaders when they first approached the fence. But the soldiers manning them had been evacuated before the attack on the morning of October 7th. All except the soldiers manning this one. Accidents happen, I guess. The whole perimeter is patrolled 24 hours a day on the ground, including tanks, and from the air, of course. And backing this whole system is a battery of 28 Apache helicopters, capable of flying 200 miles an hour, firing 600 explosive 30mm machine gun rounds per minute, plus Hellfire missiles, and... Less than five minutes. ...away from Gaza. Paratroopers on call and ready to be flown in anywhere in minutes. The military base near the Gaza border is capable of responding within minutes with 200 soldiers armed to the teeth. And of course the bombers, currently murdering children in Gaza, would arrive in seconds after takeoff. If one of these multiple standard defense measures had been in operation, active on the morning of October 7th, the attacks would have had zero chance of breaching the wall alive, much less hurting anyone on the other side of the wall. As we are about to see, Hamas had been on the warpath for 40 minutes before the sun came up. The helicopter should have been in the air 35 minutes before this video was taken. 
given that the attack was already underway at this point, these guys should have been obliterated as they first left town and started down the dirt roads to the fence. But we're just getting started. They're called in Hebrew Tatsbi Tanot, which is basically the command and control center. These are the people, mostly females, who observe, who's tasked with observing the Gaza border fence. As there's actual video footage of those same uh, command control center operators reporting on the breach of the fence. They did, and it's documented. From the very start of the attack, the balloons allowed these spotters to see the pickups the minute these Hamas fighters started off from deep inside Gaza. And these women called it in. We saw people running to the border from every direction, running with guns. We saw motorbikes and pickup trucks driving straight at the fence. We watched them blow up the fence and destroy it. And we might have been crying, but we continued to do our jobs at the same time. We were taught that we would report on the incident, we would direct helicopters to the scene, and someone would come and save us. But the helicopters never came. The spotter's tiny base was overrun. Fifteen were killed, and seven were taken hostages. These spotters are, of course, furious. The IDF left us like sitting ducks on a range. The spotters, who had been abandoned by the army, were simply slaughtered. This Washington Post PBS documentary has something to tell us about the cameras on the balloons. Video from the attack shows one of the balloons. We were told it had been cut loose by the militants. So one of the bazillion lies Israel has told about the attack is that the spotters couldn't see the attackers because their cameras had been cut. That is a lie. The balloons were not detached. The spotters saw Hamas coming and they continued reporting, even as Hamas attacked their unguarded facility. But these army spotters were not the only ones calling in red alerts. Israelis living near the wall heard the explosions at the wall. They saw the rockets and called in 30 red alerts. In fact, at 6 a.m., people as far away as Jerusalem saw this massive, unprecedented firing of rockets and were terrified. As our lady veteran friend recalls for us. I live in Jerusalem, specifically in the center. And I saw those things from already at 6 in the morning. And I knew about it at 6 in the morning. Me, as a, right now as a citizen. Wow, explain to me how the army didn't know it and they didn't come to help those people. Hamas began launching rockets before sunrise, at least half an hour before any of the explosions at the wall or trucks or motorcycles heading for the fence. And early as it was, there were earlier alarms from Israeli intelligence in the middle of the night that Hamas was on the move. You've likely heard about the Nova Music Festival that was attacked and 350 people murdered, mostly burned alive. Lawyers for the victims have brought a lawsuit. There's much more to this story that we'll get to later, but for now, let's just focus on the fact that the lawsuit blames the army for failing to notify concert goers when signs of a possible Hamas attack emerged late the night before on Friday, October 6. The military concedes that there was unusual activity by Hamas that was detected and discussed, and decisions were made, though obviously those decisions were not to beef up defenses, but to remove them. I'm on the side of the lawyers that this is incomprehensible, how the defendants did not order the party to be dispersed immediately. In fact, I find incomprehensible to be the only word to describe all this stuff. You will too, I think. For example, the women soldiers, the spotters, also heard this story about how the security services were warning about a terrorist infiltration and increased the presence of special forces and placed these various units on alert. 
The few surviving spotters are furious that they were not alerted or evacuated, but were left like sitting ducks, completely unarmed and defenseless, for the Hamas invaders to slaughter. You may not be surprised at this point to learn that this warning Friday night was also not the first alarm. The Washington Post and PBS sent two reporters on a mission to Israel to investigate how Hamas was able to penetrate Israel's impenetrable defenses. One of the first things they learned, however, was the fact that detailed plans and all sorts of training videos had been posted online in the weeks before the attacks. A plan that, as we discovered, had been brewing in plain sight. When I first saw this video, I was like, oh, this is video from the day of. Like, how did they get this produced out so quickly? And then once you look closer, go. It's obviously a training video. Our investigation found multiple videos recorded by Hamas detailing their planning measures. Posted on social media before the attack, visible to all. We found videos of militants training for attacks on mock-ups of Israeli compounds. Videos posted soon after the attack showed they had also been practicing the use of paragliders. These same women soldiers, the spotters, told the leading newspapers in Israel that for a month and a half before the October 7 attack, they saw Hamas training camps where they had built an exact replica of machine gun towers just like the ones in the fence. The incidents they saw were not isolated, and they were not tiny, they were massive. They'd never seen anything like it. They didn't just report, they yelled at their commanders that their reports had to be taken seriously, that Hamas was training for an attack. Congressional leaders were told by U.S. intelligence that Israel had been warned by the Egyptians, their closest ally in the region, three days before the attack. The Egyptians confirmed this story. They'd warned Israel of a coming explosion and that it would be big. The New York Times reported that Israeli officials obtained Hamas's battle plan more than a year before the attack. This planning document was 40 pages long and detailed point by point exactly the kind of devastating attack that was coming. Holy crap! Israel's own analysts also noted the day-long training exercises that the spotters had seen, which fully matched the Hamas battle plan. This evidence was largely ignored or dismissed by Israeli intelligence and the military, our investigation found. Largely ignored. Largely is not the right word. Hell, completely is not the right word. They didn't ignore all this information that we just spent the last 15 minutes reviewing. As we are about to see, they very much responded to it by withdrawing 99% of the defenses, leaving those individuals that the Israeli secret intelligence services, the Mossad, had chosen to die completely unprotected, lambs chosen to be slaughtered. This video is mind-boggling. You have to please note at the top of the screen that the New York Times calls this base the heart of all military operations along the Gaza border. What you are seeing take place is this massive attack launched by Hamas upon this... The, this... wait, what? This completely abandoned military base and I count at least five and maybe seven Hamas fighters. We were told there were over a thousand. WTF is up with that. And look at the length of this guy's shadow. This is not dawn. The sun is well up. It's at least an hour past dawn. Maybe two. Nearly three hours after the rockets, and well over an hour after the first attack on the fences. In response to the news of an impending attack, 
the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, withdrew the military completely from Gaza. I'm sorry, that's an inside job. Again, these women were purposefully murdered by the IDF on orders from the Mossad, the Israeli secret intelligence service. You need to reorient your thinking, I believe, to recognize that everyone who died on October 7th was murdered as part of this plan by the Mossad to justify genocide in Gaza. So, you might expect these women weren't the only soldiers set up like lambs for the slaughter. The New York Times also reports that although the defenses at the base were removed, many soldiers were not only left behind, but they were allowed to keep sleeping. Several were killed in their bunks. The death of these soldiers was not an accident. Where was the IDF, asked the New York Times. It was part of a plan that was so insanely obvious that the New York Times couldn't resist asking. In all these videos of Hamas, where's the goddamned Israeli army? This body cam video was taken by Hamas operatives. It shows them driving miles to the border fence, kicking up dust the whole way in full view of the Israeli spotters who saw it and reported it. In order to have any credibility, official Israeli television has had to admit what everyone in Israel already knew, that the military disappeared as this tiny invasion took place. A stopwatch counting from the first explosion until the moment terrorist squad number one crosses into Israel shows seven and a half minutes. In that time, they meet no Israeli resistance. Let's revisit this crucial point. At this point in the video, where we see this explosion in the distance, terrorist squad number one had already been on their way for some time, and the spotters would have seen all of their movements. So, the spotters said that they gave warning to the IDF immediately, and this would have been well over seven and a half minutes before Hamas arrived at the wall. And yet... In that time, they meet no Israeli resistance. And what about the machine gun towers placed every few hundred yards, one of which we see in action here? These guns would have evaporated those guys in the trucks when they were still hundreds of yards away. You remember we were told that special teams mobilized at 4 a.m.? My guess is that these special teams were Mossad operatives, mobilized to remove all the soldiers who would have otherwise operated these guns. It seems these special teams forgot to remove one of the tower operators, but no other Hamas fighters were killed by these guns. How long did this stand down last? The New York Times again tells us that after seven hours, one reservist paratrooper major mobilized on his own, and to his surprise, the roads were empty. Seven hours into the fighting, there was no visible military response. Good gravy! An incredible story, corroborated by this CNN footage, showing that the Israeli forces arrived at this bus stop shelter right in the middle of the major Hamas activity, seven hours after the attack began. Seven hours. That must be an exaggeration, no? Incomprehensible. Yasmin Porat is a key witness to events at Kibbutz Berry, where 112 Israeli civilians were killed. She says it took 10 hours for the army to arrive. Do you know how long it takes an attack helicopter to get activated and blow up any one of those tractors or pickup trucks? Less than five minutes. And yet, for six to eight hours, Hamas wandered all over southern Israel, unsuccessfully looking for a fight. Trust me, all the vets in Israel were asking the same question. And what is the Israeli military supposed to say? Everybody, even this idiot, knew there was a six-hour stand-down. So, look, I can understand why there are so many questions in regard to the IDF and how it took them six hours to respond to Hamas's terrorist attack, but unfortunately... And what could the military say? We couldn't use helicopters because they didn't know who and what is going on there. Right. 
They couldn't tell that these guys with the RPGs and bulldozers were Hamas. Or these guys. 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 Or these fools, my favorites, parked, waiting, doing everything they could think of to attract the military. And then the director behind the camera whispers, Psst, hey, Ahmed, run out there and pose for the camera. Now, pretend you're shooting at something. Cool. By the way, there are all these videos showing fewer than a dozen Hamas wandering around and there are no videos of Hamas fighting the Israeli army. None. I'm just saying. These two Washington Post reporters made a big deal about Hamas blowing all these narrow holes in the wall. It took them only minutes. And then we are treated to this very short parade of at least eight Hamas people walking single file through these narrow openings. But after these guys go through these narrow holes... Then what? Do they wait for the bus? Hitchhike? These holes are useless if the trucks can't get through. There's something fishy going on here, right? Hey, look at all these completely useless holes the amazing wizards of Hamas were able to magically make. Ooh. This is all smoke and mirrors, misdirection, to distract you from the nearly obvious truth that the trucks went through a gate. Israel, you see, built a 20-foot-high wall, 22 miles long, with a gate right in the middle of it. And then they left this gate completely undefended. At the risk of repeating myself, what the frog? And look at the welcoming committee that received these two trucks, carrying a thousand soldiers each. Mossad operatives opened up gates in the wall to allow the trucks through. You just saw it. They opened up gates in the wall and then they guided the Hamas trucks through. That's how the trucks got through the wall. Good luck finding that fact anywhere. Go pay for this video right now. There was help from inside. This operation was not made by Hamas. This operation was an operation that was an excuse for a bigger cause. Jeffrey Sachs is a world-class economist, a UN official promoting sustainable development, a Columbia professor, and an important truth-teller. What is one of the uh, dark truths that is known to experts and should be known to the public is Netanyahu played with Hamas. He built Hamas. He supported Hamas. He gave Hamas the base in Gaza because he wanted to weaken the Palestinians in general because he's been playing a game all along to avoid a Palestinian state. And you can read about this everywhere. Now, uh, this is even told by his own political associates. Let's start with this one point. You can read about this everywhere. Now, uh, this is even told by his own political associates. Sachs is a very well-respected, established policy advisor. John Oliver is surely less serious, but he's much more mainstream. He wins the Emmy for his category every year and listen as he makes all the same points as Professor Sachs. But Hamas branded itself as the party of resistance to Israel and undermined the peace process with a long series of attacks and suicide bombings. Netanyahu's political career seemed dead, and it wasn't until a series of bus bombings by Hamas in Israel as part of their own efforts to derail the peace accords that Netanyahu was first elected prime minister. His cabinet is stocked with extremists. His current finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, explaining that strategy out loud in 2015. The Palestinian Authority is a burden, and Hamas is a terrorist organization that no one will recognize and no one will give its status in the ICC. No one will let them lead a decision in the Security Council. The main pitch we are playing now is international delegitimization. Hamas, at this point, in my opinion, will be an asset. Hamas is an asset. And for years, Netanyahu's government was actually allowing suitcases of cash to be delivered to Hamas. <laughs> when that scandal broke, Netanyahu insisted that that money was for humanitarian aid, which still doesn't explain why it had to be delivered in luggage in the back of a fucking car. I give him a lot of credit for even doing this really dangerous piece, though he neglects to mention that there's only one reason for making deliveries of cash. 
because black market arms dealers don't accept credit cards. This picture is from the Times of Israel, in a story about Israel giving Hamas billions of dollars in cash. And this is from a Haaretz article about Israel giving Hamas billions of dollars in cash. And this is a New York Times article about Israel giving Hamas billions of dollars in cash. But this article is killer because it quotes Netanyahu saying that he wanted Hamas to be strong and that he encouraged giving Hamas money for weapons. Billions in $100 bills was delivered in suitcases. Netanyahu, of course, denies it, but all of these news organizations ignored his denials and just printed the evidence. But the U.S. has spies, too. And when the U.S. spies reported that Qatar was giving Hamas money to buy weapons, the Congress threatened to impose sanctions on Qatar. But Netanyahu sent his Mossad boys to meet with the congressman, and the Mossad spooks gave the congressman a nod and a wink and told them to back off, which they did. These billions in cash payments were approved at the highest levels of the Mossad. David Barnia, the Mossad chief, welcomed the money. The Qatari bagman was escorted into Gaza by Mossad agents, and the chief of Mossad approved these payouts right up until a few weeks before the October 7th false flag attack. Of course the money went to buy weapons, and the Mossad knew it. Every Israeli with any intelligence knew the money was for weapons. Of course it was, and of course they knew. These pictures were all over the Internet. That's what some of us call... An inside job. Didn't the Israeli army in those 11, 10 or 11 camps hear the bangs when they blew up whatever they had to blow up to get across the border? Mm -hmm. There's something very fishy about that. Speaking of fishy, in early December, two courageous and prestigious law professors published a shocking story that someone was shorting the stocks of Israeli companies just before the October 7th attacks. That is, on October 2nd, millions of dollars in bets were being made on dozens of Israeli stocks, betting that they would go down in the following week on dozens of stocks, The bets on just one of these dozens of companies made the criminals $10 million. And the professor said in so many words that these criminal stock traders obviously knew about the coming attacks and profited from these murders by making these bets. The story made news, sort of. You never heard it. These two heroes told CNN that what they found was the tip of the iceberg. CNN looked for someone to criticize them, but all they could find was this Yale law professor who called the article shocking and called the evidence in the article strong. Reuters interviewed the head of the Israeli Stock Exchange, who told them that there was nothing unusual in the number of bets being placed against the market, nothing to see here. And the same doofus also told Reuters that these short bets were made by an Israeli bank known to him, and to the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Got that? He knows who did it. And the criminals who place these bets can't be terrorists if they're friends of his. They're probably members of the Israeli government, so they can't be terrorists, right? They're calling it their 9-11. What the hell happened on the American 9-11? Nobody knows. Clearly, the official narrative has huge holes in it. It shouldn't be a surprise that the exact same thing happened on 9-11. Mainstream qualified scholars found insider trading then as well. There's a footnote at the end all about it. The implications in both stories are earth-shaking. I'm sorry, that's an inside job. They are, as we speak, committing genocide in Gaza. It's so insane what they're doing. It's beyond our capacity to imagine such evil. We've seen that so much of what we have been told was a lie, that it throws doubt on all the stories we've been told, like that Hamas killed all these civilians. Obviously, we can't believe it just because the Israeli government said it. So let's have a closer look. I hope you'll notice that Hamas had no motive to kill civilians, or soldiers for that matter, they wanted hostages. 
to trade for the estimated 10,000 Palestinians held captive by Israel. For Hamas to kill civilians would only help the Mossad and the Zionists to justify their genocide. The Mossad brags about their operatives inside Hamas. And these Mossad operatives are the only ones who would have had a reasonable motive to wantonly kill civilians in the name of Hamas, as we see here, throwing a grenade into a bus station shelter full of peace-loving fans from the music festival. But this leader of Hamas says they had no intention of killing civilians. His saying so is worthless, of course, except that it is corroborated by so much real evidence, most powerfully the surviving witnesses, former hostages, who say that their captors treated them humanely. This old lady was taken hostage, and we see her here being released okay, to the Red go. Cross, okay. and go. she turns back to her captor, takes his hand, and says, Shalom. Okay. After she has been... These women were taken hostage and eventually released. They were tickled, it seems, with how well they were treated. זה מים, זה כתוב להם בקוראן, מים מתוקים כאלה. עכשיו אמרתי לו שזה קטע, כי השם שלי בישראל זה אגם. יזמן פורט שוקט ישראלי רדיו with her description of how she was treated by her captors while being held captive inside the קיבוץ בארי. הם מתעללים בכם או שהם... הם לא מתעללים בנו, הם מתנהגים אלינו בצורה מאוד אנושית, זה אומר שהם שומרים עלינו. כן, מה זה אומר אנושית? שומרים עלינו. The body cam video taken by Hamas also undercuts the allegation that Hamas wantonly killed civilians. And the videos recovered later showed the rampage through the kibbutz. Rampage? But look for yourself how carefully and gingerly these men are creeping around. And look at this poor fool with a cigarette lighter setting fire to some decoration. This old man says Hamas occupied his house with him and his wife inside for hours and then left it looking like this, totally ruined. It's obvious, no, that these houses were not bombed out by men who had no bombs but only small arms and cigarette lighters. This was done by Israeli tank shells and Hellfire missiles. In a minute, we'll look at Israeli media accounts of how the tanks and helicopters in fact inflicted this damage. Most of the dead were found under the rubble of these bombed-out houses. And to what purpose did Israel blow up these houses, with over a hundred civilians inside, except as part of a plan? To kill these civilians, and then to blame their deaths on Hamas, and to use this wanton murder by Israeli soldiers of their own people to justify genocide against Palestinians. Another point made by these videos is that these Hamas fighters seem to be wandering. They shoot carelessly at a passing car, but this seems random and careless. And what are these guys looking for? Like everyone else, they're looking for Israeli soldiers to fight. but the Israeli military had mysteriously evaporated and wouldn't appear for another six hours at least. If these guys were trying to massacre civilians, you'd be watching a video of them massacring civilians. And you hear it explicitly in this video. Hey guys, look, here comes the army, yay! We've already seen that Hamas is entirely financed by the Mossad and infiltrated by the Mossad. And yet, in spite of the billions invested by the Mossad, Hamas barely seems to exist. The notion that a paraglider is a weapon is a sad, pathetic joke. Hamas put on a big show in April, five months before the attack. But no one dressed like these guys is seen in any of the videos from October 7th. I guess they had to take the costumes back. Hamas fired hundreds of these skyrockets. These are fireworks, not weapons. They do zero damage. And this ragtag gaggle of a half a dozen amateurs in pickup trucks 
armed with pea shooters is not an invasion. And it's a f***ing pickup army that's, that's killing us. At noon, the Israeli military's southern command, the people in the center of the action, assessed that 200 Hamas had entered Israel. Most videos show fewer than 10 gunmen. None shows more than a dozen. And for this stage show, the photos show 20 or so. This one shows about 40. My estimate, based on what I see in the videos, is that there were fewer than 50 altogether on October 7th. And it's a f***ing pickup army that's, that's killing us. A kibbutz is a commune. The residents are communists. They are the left wing of Israel. They believe Israel can live in peace with Palestinians by helping the Palestinians form a Palestinian state. These peaceniks are hated in the extreme by Netanyahu and his gaggle of racist, bloodthirsty uber-Zionists. The Nova Music Festival also was a peace festival, attended by the younger kibbutz crowd. There is no group of people on the planet whom Netanyahu would rather see dead. I'm not a fan of numbers games, especially where the numbers come from sources I regard as liars. But the numbers from the lying Israeli government are all we have to work with, and taking the numbers given to us by these lying monsters using their numbers, it appears that the IDF killed virtually everyone who died on October 7th. They now say that the total number of dead is less than 1,200, and they say that of these 1,200, 700 are police and military. So, 1,200 total minus 700 military leaves around 500 civilian dead. The total dead from Kibbutz Berry is 112, and the total murdered at the music festival, we are told, is 360. The total number of civilians killed anywhere, then, besides the Nova Peace Music Festival and Kibbutz Berry, is 28. This little numbers display suggests, then, that all the Hamas fighters we've seen, roaming all over southern Israel, shooting randomly at civilians to get them to call the police, and all of the hours and hours and hours of unhampered wandering and shooting, this math display suggests Hamas killed something around 28 civilians, which corroborates what the Hamas spokesman said about not killing civilians, and these numbers corroborate what our four former hostages told us. In fact, each fact corroborates the others. We've already seen that Hamas did not have the weapons to destroy these houses. And this witness, Yasmin Porat, not only confirms how well she and the other hostages were treated, to the shock of all who heard her, she says that the vast majority of the killing was undoubtedly done by the IDF. <laughs> על האדמה בחוץ, ממש כצון הטבח, מול הירי של הימם שלנו וה... והמחבלים. הטרוריסטים ירו בהם? לא, הם נהרגו מהחילופי ירי, תבין שהיה חילופי ירי מאוד מאוד קשים. זאת אומרת, יכול להיות שזה כוחותינו ירו בהם? כשניסו לפסל את החמאס? הם יחסו את כולם, כולל הבני ערובה, כי היה שם חילופי ירי מאוד מאוד קשים. אביב של טנק שירו לתוך הבית, שזה בית קיבוצי קטן, זה לא איזה, רואים את זה בחדשות. כן. זה לא מקום גדול. וברגע הזה כולם נהרגו, היה שקט. כולם נהרגו. מהחילופי אש. מהחילופי אש, כלומר יכול להיות שגם זה מאש כוחותינו? חד משמעית. כן? This is worth repeating, but let's definitely not miss her confirmation that a tank destroyed the house that she'd been in. And everyone in it. And finally, Haaretz, the most respected news source in Israel, interviewed a witness from the same kibbutz, and, according to the newspaper and their witness, two days after the attack started, the tank commanders decided to shell the house and kill all their occupants. The price for this decision was terrible, at least 112 people. Right here at this one kibbutz. They couldn't wait them out, because, you know, murdering their own people and blaming Hamas to justify genocide in Gaza, that's how they do it. It's kind of their thing. 
imagine. It's beyond our capacity to imagine such evil. Now let's remind ourselves that lawyers representing 42 survivors of the music festival are suing the military for failing to notify the concert organizers that the night before there were signs of a possible Hamas attack. The lawyers learned that the top security officials held two emergency meetings at 3 a.m. on Saturday, three hours before the rockets announced the beginning of the Hamas attack, uh, I mean, the Mossad operation. The lawyers wrote that this failure was incomprehensible. Well, they hadn't seen this video, which I think makes this failure completely comprehensible. It's beyond our capacity to imagine such evil. Not anymore, it's not. Sadly, there are still more opportunities for us to learn to comprehend such evil. You see, with all these reports of an insane increase in Hamas activity near the border, only two days before the festival was planned to start, the location was moved right up to the border. And, it seems, all the local military people in the Gaza division opposed holding so large a festival so close to the Gaza border. It was just unnecessarily dangerous, and they were overruled by the higher-ups, who were the guys receiving the reports from the spotters of all the increased Hamas activities. We've seen all this evidence showing that Hamas doesn't kill civilians, and that the IDF does kill its own, firing tank shells into houses full of hostages, deliberately leaving their women spotters like lambs to the slaughter. And as the weeks passed, insanely incriminating stories continued to come out, especially in the Hebrew language press, about the slaughter of festival goers by the Israeli helicopters. The command to attack and slaughter civilians came from the military's high command. In an interview with Israel's Mako news outlet, one Apache pilot reflected that he knew that many of these vehicles may have contained Israeli captives but he chose to open fire anyway. The Apache pilots testified that they fired a huge amount of munitions, emptied the belly of the helicopters in minutes, flew to rearm, and returned to the air again and again. The Apache helicopters appear to have focused on vehicles from the Nova Electronic Music Festival and attacked cars with apparent knowledge that Israeli captives could be inside. They also fired on unarmed people exiting cars or walking on foot through the fields. You read it, now see it. Perhaps inspired by the facts coming out in the press, someone leaked a few seconds of camera footage from one of the helicopters showing exactly what we just read. These are civilians trying to escape in their cars and being fired on by a helicopter with Hellfire missiles. The people you see on the right were lucky enough to get out before the helicopters arrived. But you can recognize that they're the same concert goers as the people on the left. This inconceivable video gives important context to this inconceivable quote from an Admiral Daniel Hagani. There were hundreds of deaths, including many terrorists, or maybe some terrorists. There weren't very many in the first place. And look at all the cars the helicopters incinerated. Hamas could not have done this. Hamas couldn't even have sat in these cars. There weren't enough of them. This was a massive slaughter of Israeli liberals, peaceniks, music lovers by the extreme right-wing Nazi government. But let's go back to this photo. It is, I find, the most commonly used picture from the music festival. And it may be the only one showing unburned cars. But now... With all this background that we've been developing over the last 40 minutes, and with a little close examination, we can reliably infer that these cars were assembled here for this photo by the Mossad. I mean, look at these burnt patches on the ground. Indisputably, there were cars here which were burned by explosive helicopter fire, which made these burned patches. But where are the burned cars that made these burned patches? They're gone, and these unburned cars are now here. There's something fishy going on. Obviously, the burned cars that scorched these burned patches have been removed, and these 
unburned cars have been positioned, staged in this photo, which, as I say, has been widely promoted. It would be stupid and irresponsible not to conclude at this point that the staging, the removing of the burned cars, and the repositioning of unburned cars was done to hide what really happened. Of course it was. The IDF helicopters arrived and slaughtered the last 360 people trying to leave. An unstaged photo taken right after the helicopter attack would show these burned-out cars lining the road with burned-out festival goers inside them. So the Mossad had to completely deconstruct and then rebuild the scene and then photograph it, which is what they obviously did here. To me, this analysis feels like an indisputable fact. And now we can piece together why they did it, now that we know the incredible crime they are covering up. For the plan to succeed, hundreds of Israeli civilians had to die. And hundreds hadn't yet died anywhere else in Israel before the helicopters arrived at the music festival. For the plan to flatten Gaza to succeed, the people in these cars had to die. war crimes are happening and our governments it feels like they are siding you know with israel what has israel got over the uk and the us that is allowing this to happen because it's horrendous great question in fact she's asking how one tiny tail manages to wag two dogs one of them a superpower i want to try to answer that question but to do that i need to present some history the short version for now really it needs a whole nother video but let's see what we can squeeze into a few minutes. In 1917, Arthur Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, acting on behalf of the British government, wrote this semi-well-known Balfour Declaration, promising Lord Rothschild, the most powerful banker in Britain or anywhere, the use of Palestine as a national home for Jewish people. This promise was not made to the Jews. It was not addressed to the Jews, it was addressed and made to the Rothschilds. But as JFK wrote to his father in 1939, Palestine did not belong to the British. It wasn't theirs to give. So how do we explain then that the British felt compelled to commit this monumental act of thievery, stealing an entire country from its people, the Palestinians, and giving it away, again, not to the Jews, but to the Rothschilds? Well, a little background. 100 years before Balfour, in 1825, the Rothschilds took formal control of the British economy and state, taking over the Bank of England. Open, formal domination of all things British. This was not the Jews who did this. This was the Rothschilds. Four years later, in 1829, the Rothschilds formally declared their intention to take over Palestine, and they demanded that the Turkish Sultan sell it to them. Again, this was not the Jews making this demand. It was the Rothschilds. But the Sultan refused. What was he thinking? How dare he refuse to sell his Palestinian children when commanded to do so? He had to go. So, in 1914, the Austrians, longtime slaves to the Rothschilds, started World War I. To do what now? Oh, to bring down the Sultan. At the very end of this war, the British, who had been under a hundred years of Rothschild domination at this point, for no particular reason, ordered a hundred thousand British soldiers into Palestine. After three years of the brutality of World War I, these soldiers were desperate to return to their families. Their families were even more desperate to have them return home. But who cares what they wanted, not their government? So the British government sent 100,000 soldiers to invade and occupy Palestine and immediately, I mean immediately, handed it to the Rothschilds, even though it wasn't theirs. Again, the British did not do any of this for the Jews or for the citizens of Britain, certainly, but for the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds have dominated the economy of the USA since 1776 at least. 
They were the prime beneficiaries of the American Revolution, but that's a topic for another video. And of course, they try today with all their might to push the U.S. into wars and policies that benefit them. AIPAC is just one of their tentacles. And every president since JFK has genuinely and wisely feared them. The bad guys have dominated the mainstream media for hundreds of years. Steve Bannon founded Cambridge Analytica, a military disinformation war machine, and they now control most of the so-called alternative media. So who can you trust? For example, are these stories real? Well, you can check. Pick five words, put them into Google in quotes, and the search will bring up the original article if it exists, and you can read it for yourself. Now you know. Go out and defeat the machine. On 9-11, we uh, obviously have a few things which, for historians, are now um, bizarre. We need to investigate them in more detail. One thing, you know, is the World Trade Center 7, which collapsed, that is well known. Another thing, maybe less well known, is the, the so-called put option issue. A put option, um, for those who are not active on financial markets, is a bet that a share will fall. Okay, you, 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 for instance, buy shares of Lufthansa, an airplane, uh, and you, you say, okay, I, I think this company is doing great, and all you hope for is that the shares are rising. That's the normal, you know, investor thing. But uh, people don't know that you can also bet on a share that is falling and make a profit from it. And, and for that, you need a put option, because actually your speculation is then that this share is going down, and if it really does, you get a lot of money. That's the framework. Now, on 9-11, we uh, can show that you have put options on American Airlines and United Airlines. And these are exactly the two uh, companies uh, which were involved because their planes were used um, for the terrorist attack. I have a colleague here in Switzerland. Uh, he's uh, in Zurich at the uh, University of Zurich, and his name is Professor Mark Chesney. And he has, he has looked at the put option issue, and he can prove that there was inside the trading on 9-11. On so some people knew that this terrorist attack was going to happen. And um, what he looked at is what there was um, inside the trading in the sense of that many people thought the, the airlines were going to go down in many different countries and they just bought put option on Singapore Airlines and Swiss Airlines and British Airways and American Airlines. Now that's not the case. It's just on United Airlines and American Airlines. So that's very specific foreknowledge that you need to actually pick the right airlines. They said it was a reputable firm that had placed these airline put option trades. Tell us about this reputable firm, Alex Brown. Yeah, it was Alex Brown, which is a subsidiary of Deutsche Bank. And they said that this is completely harmless. But um, with, what is really interesting here is that the executive director of the CIA at the time of the 9-11 attacks came directly from Alex Brown. And uh, another interesting thing is that the CEO of Alex Brown on the time of September 11th, on the next day he resigned from his post, even though he had still a contract um, for three years at Alex Brown. So this is a little bit strange, isn't it? Well, it, it demonstrates a direct uh, pipeline of information between the CIA, Alex Brown, where these put options are. And I, I believe after the events, something like $5 million of profits were never claimed, correct? Yeah, there the are different numbers out, but we can say something in between $2 million and $5 million, yes. So, you know, to sum it up, you had insider trading on 9-11. Somebody, you know, knew that you can make a million uh, or more uh, even on a day where people are get killed when it's all a tragedy. Uh, some people get rich on that very day. And what we as historians would expect is that on such an issue, you would have a very thorough investigation by the Security and Exchange Commission, SEC. 
And that didn't happen. It just didn't happen. What we saw was that the Keen report, which is the investigation um, that the government of President Bush um, uh, said could happen, that this investigation said, yes, there was insider trading, uh, but we couldn't trace it back to Osama bin Laden. Okay, so uh, to whom could you trace it back? You know, that would be the next question, but they just don't do it. They just don't do it. So the put option issue is something that needs to be clarified if ever we want to understand uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11.